Now, this was a new story to me. I had to add it this morning when I woke up. Well, I'd already planned the show, but I saw this story. I thought, I've got to, I've got to discuss this. It's absolutely bonkers. Sadiq Khan, our wonderful layer of, mayor of Londonistan, has seen it within his remit to splash out £6.3 million pounds on London Overground. What do you think he's spending it on? Making the overground accessible for people with disabilities, wheelchair access. Um, making it so th so that there's less knife crime, so that the CCTV works, that police are on hand. No, no, none of that. He's going to rename the lines and give them a different color. Six point three million pounds. Let's have a look at some of what's going to be what's going to be done. These new names. Excuse me for using the BBC website. I do apologise for that. Hashtag defund the BBC. New names for the London Overground. So this is the line that is t usually orange. Um, they're going to split it up into different sections, have the Liberty, Lioness, Mildmay, Suffragette, Weaver, and Windrush lines. Now, this makes sense to some degree because having just one massive London Overground where it's just kind of all over the place is difficult to navigate, especially for foreigners and tourists and whatever. I get that. But just look at some of the names and some of the reasons of why they've chosen them. Right, here's Sadiq Khan, our wonderful mayor, on Twitter talking through the decisions and you just know this isn't normal Londoners making these choices right they say they've consulted people but political speech consultancy means essentially we made up our minds and then we put the suggestions to people and affirmed the choices that we wanted all along it doesn't mean that people have had any real input but first of all the Windrush line straight away critical race theory get race in there as as much as possible because this is London why not don't forget white Brits are in a minority in our capital city but we need to be reminded of that at every single turn. So and, and notice in the billboards, in the um, in the imagery, even the ones that aren't to do with Windrush, we'll see that very few white British faces are in there. Anyway, Windrush line, celebrating or recognizing the contribution of the Windrush generation who continue to shape and enrich London's cultural and social identity today. Don't get me started on the cultural enrichment argument, but the idea that London is, is shaped and, and enriched by the particular demographic. London is made up of many people from many demographics, and this whole emphasis on one particular demographic is kind of creepy and weird, to be honest. I come from, you know, half my family is Windrush generation. My dad's father came over from the Caribbean, from Jamaica, and I still find this obsession with Windrush very, very strange. If you want a united society, if you want everyone to kind of get along and integrate and become one, surely you don't focus on the things that divide us. You focus on the things that bring us together, our Britishness, not, oh, your family originally came from there, did they? It's no, you are here, you're one of us. Take on board our identity, our culture, our values, our religion. That's how multiculturalism would work if it was ever going to work. But of course, we know that multiculturalism doesn't work. Multi-ethnicity has a chance, but multiculturalism does not work because you need a predominant culture. And we are eroding our predominant culture and pretending we don't have one. Anyway, the next line, the Weaver line, Celebrating an area of London known for its textile trade. Yeah, okay, I can get behind that one. That one's fair enough. I mean, it's still massively effeminate, and you'll notice another theme throughout these is that they're not all just uh, brown faces. It's all feminine as well. It's all part of this drive to make us a fem in feminine society. Oh, speaking of which, the suffragette line. Celebrating this movement with its London links that fought for votes for women and paved the way for women's rights. Feminism is a scourge on our society. It's undermined our very way of life. It's led to the mess that we're in right now. It's, it's one area that we all concede too much ground on. Even conservatives, even Christians, we see feminism as a good thing. This idea that we are all equal and interchangeable. No, we're not. Men and women are different. That's not to say men are better or women are better, but men and women are different and complement each other and are not interchangeable. You can't swap a man out for a woman or the other way around. We've got to remember that fact, that things like this do not help us. Again, it's, it's divisive, uh, it's unhelpful, it's highly politicized. Why would you want a, a tube line called the suffragette line? Anyway, next one, Mildmay line, honoring the work of the Mildmay NHS hospital. I know you're probably wondering how long until we had an NHS line. Here it is. The Mildmay NHS hospital during the HIV AIDS crisis that made it a valued and respected place for the LGBTQ plus community today. 
I don't want London to be a valued and respected place for the LGBTQ plus community. I don't want there to be the recognition that there is a separate community that only Rainbow Mafia belong to and the rest of us are part of some bigoted community. It's like, again, if we want everyone to be a part of one London, why are we dividing based on immutable characteristics? And at this point, so not just race, not just gender, but now sexuality too. Our tube lines are being renamed over the critical theories. Our country has been captured. It's effeminate. It's, I mean, look at this, the lioness line. Honoring the legacy and achievements of England women's football team, which continues to inspire the next generation of women and girls in sport. Why not just three lions? Why not just English sport? It has to be women's and girls sport. You see, they're making a political point every step of the way that you will become effeminate, you will become feminists, you will get on board with critical theories. This whole program is not actually about the overground. It's not about supporting tourists and helping them navigate through the overground. It's about implementing DIE, diversity, inclusion, and equity. It's about the rainbow mafia making it known that they've taken over. When you look at you know those old promenades down Regent Street where we used to have the Union flag, and these days we have the rainbow flag, it's to show us that we are conquered it's exactly the same as last week we talked about the Mohammedans taking over the bridge in Westminster outside the Palace of Westminster. It's to let us know that they are dominating us and there's nothing that we can do about it. We are becoming an effeminate communist society and this is all about it. Oh, there's another one, the Liberty Line. Celebrating the long-standing freedom that is a defining feature of London and the historical independence of the people of Havering. I don't think we deserve that that name anymore. I don't think as a, as a people we fight or believe fight for or believe in liberty anymore. I think we saw that over the COVID situation. One slight sniff of a of a pandemic and people threw away all their freedoms, threw away all their liberties, and said, "Government, save me! Government, help me! Government, you are here to protect me." When I, when indeed it should be, the government is there to govern. The government is there literally to represent us. It's an elected representative. It's not there to rule our lives. But people handed over their liberties and said, no, I don't want to live my free life. I want you to tell me what to do. So I don't think we deserve a liberty line, to be honest with you, until we start to fight for liberties again. Last week, we talked about people who are being arrested for silently praying in their own heads on the streets of our very capital. How is that acceptable? Where's the liberty in that? Anyway, these, I mean, the, they're inoffensive in terms of design, but it's the small features, it's the nuance here that it is feminist, critical theories, critical race theory in particular, it's sending a message to us and I'm not happy with it. And it cost us 6.3 billion, uh, 6 million pounds. Now, when I lived in a, an area that uses the London Overground, I petitioned and campaigned to the mayor of London at the time for a, a lift so that people who were disabled in my area could get up and down to the station because it was unusable without one. And it was practically impossible to get any funding from the mayor of London but there is funding available apparently for his pet projects, things like this. Shame, I say, shame. Now, <laughs> I mentioned in the intro that Jesus Christ has apparently gone woke. This is according to some evangelicals in America. Uh, before I say anything about this, let's watch this uh, ad that came out over Super Bowl. What you know is true. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. I love your precious heart. I, I was standing. You were there. <laughs> where to start honestly i think i'll start with the positive 
So we had Jesus Christ's name proclaimed on a massive scale during the Super Bowl, one of the most watched televised events in America every year. I don't know, for some reason it's become a big deal over here too, probably because we're becoming Americanized. Uh, so it's good that Jesus Christ was front and center. That is a good thing. And the people behind it, the Hobby Lobby guys, are good Christians. You know, I've got a lot of time for Dennis Green, actually. Um, his Hobby Lobby group funded the or set up the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., which I think is probably my favorite museum, actually. It's, it's an amazing place to discover the history, not just of the Bible itself, you know, how it's put together and the different translations, but the stories of the Bible, too. It's very family friendly. It's accessible. It's just great. It's a great place. So I've got a lot of time for them. And in, in, in his defense, David Green fought the uh, Contraceptive Care Act as well in America in federal court. Uh, basically, he was fighting against this idea that companies should have to pay for insurance for their workers that includes uh, abortion and contraception, two things which Christians deem to be evil, you know, the killing of babies, essentially, and, and the divorcing of the conjugal act from God. Um, and he fought against that. So he's, a, he's said, as a family-run business, we should not have to support these things that are contrary to our beliefs and go against our religious freedom. Well done, Daddy Green. Well done. Um, sorry, David Green and well done, Hobby Lobby. Great stuff. But this ad, it's very clear that people on the team are not necessarily Christians. So going from what was on their website, our work represents the input from Christians who believe that Jesus is the son of God, as well as many others, though not Christians, share a deep admiration from the, for the man. I, I, no, let's, let me stop you right there. If you're going to be talking about Jesus, if you're going to be pretending to proclaim him as the Lord and Savior, then you need to recognize that he is our Lord and Savior. Otherwise, it's just weird to have non-Christians putting together a campaign for, for Christ is, is strange. But it, it bled through. It's clearly bled through. Because that video, again, was reaped or absolutely dripping in critical theories. I'm going to go through it with the sound off. So first of all, this message that Jesus washed feet. Well, yes, he did wash feet, but whose feet did he wash? Well, Jesus Christ washed the feet of his disciples of his chosen apostles, of his bishops, to show that he was serving them, to show to lead them an example, so that the, when they are serving their congregations, they are to wash the feet of their congregations in return. Jesus didn't go around washing the feet of everybody, and he certainly didn't wash the feet of sinners and leave them in their sin. And this is the core problem with this, and why a lot of people took issue with this campaign, in that it leaves out half of the gospel. So the gospel is, yes, repent of your sins, and have faith in Jesus Christ. It's yes, love Jesus Christ, but the repent of your sins part is the important part. I mean, it's all important. You can't take what you can't have salvation without repentance. This is what Christ told us. Anyway, look, from the first slide, we've got a police officer washing the feet of a interesting looking black fellow, clearly taken straight out of Black Lives Matter. I won't comment on the, the chap's attire or what he represents, but it's clearly not. I mean, it's sending a message. Well, I'm surprised on this one we don't have blue hair. We've got red hair, but okay. Another critical theory is it's on, the underlying tone here is clearly, look, white man, wash the feet of the indigenous or the aboriginal or whatever. It's like, you know, you are the oppressor and the colored folk are the oppressed. Therefore, you need to wash that. It's, it's divisive. It's not very helpful. This one is the one that got me the most. This is the worst one. Family planning clinics. Now, family planning is an oxymoron. It's an, it's an antithesis of what family planning should, all, should be about. Family planning should be about how to plan having a family. But fam family planning clinics like this are actually, it's a euphemism for abortion centers. So they kill families. They prevent families. It's a great evil, probably the greatest evil that I can think of. And so no Christian would ever support abortion. If, if a Christian tells you they support abortion, then they're not Christian. They're out of touch with their faith, and we should pray for them. But this is evil. Putting it there in the background, uh, what is the message there? That this young girl's had an abortion or something? If we should help people who are struggling with this kind of stuff, we shouldn't, we shouldn't encourage it. And that's the, that's the message of all of this, that we should help people who are sinning, because we are all sinners. But we shouldn't affirm people in their sin. We shouldn't encourage sin. Look, here's another... Um, white man washing the feet of another colored person because that's what white people are, are for, apparently. Oh, and another one. 
<laughs> I feel sorry for you white folk. This one's interesting. It, she's clearly not a Christian. Now, Jesus did not wash the feet of Mohammedans. He would have told, he would have told them to repent and, and find faith. I don't know what the message there was in the background of that one, but it said, shut him up. So clearly a feminist uh, argument going on. And again here, some more overt race relations. The message is clear. I get it. It's well-intentioned, but misguided. They want to put the message across that Christians are not haters or hateful. Here we say Jesus did not teach hate. Well, I mean, in some respects he did. He taught us to hate evil. He didn't t tell us to be tolerant of everything. But... Christians do have a, a kind of a, in the public square at least, the, the, the image of being haters. And that's because people see disagreement as hate these days. It's, it's affirm us in our sin, otherwise you hate us. And that's not, Christians can never affirm people in their sin. Christians can never affirm unchristian lives or anti-Christian lives. This putting Christ at the center of everything means changing the way you live. It doesn't mean going along with what you what you currently do. And that's the message of diversity, inclusion, and equality. The message of church is come, all are welcome to be changed through an encounter with Christ. It's not all are welcome to come and leave as you were because that is not Christian. And I, I'm, I'm taken aback by this whole ad, but I saw a much better approach. I saw, well, this was a clip that a friend of mine, Bree Daly, put up on Twitter. It could have been as simple as this. Simple. So he's there, he's compassionate, he's loving, he's meeting a sinner where she is, but he's not embracing her for her sin. He's embracing her because he loves her, and because he loves her, he's saying, go and sin no more. He wants us to reach our best. He wants us to become good, to become holy, to become like him. He doesn't want us to stay as we are because we are fallen. Thank you for watching my Common Sense Crusade. If you'd like to watch the whole show, you can subscribe to lotuseaters.com for as little as five pounds per month. And then you get access to a bank of content as well. My show is 3 p.m. every Thursday. See you there. Day is fault.